Namaste. Welcome to the August 2020 Journal Club session that's conducted by Samrakshan, IRIA Kochi and Kras Kochi. In the past few sessions of the Journal Club, we have looked at how to critically evaluate the scientific literature. We have focused on understanding a research paper that's published. We have looked primarily at the research methods. We have looked at the results that have been communicated. We have tried to look whether the results are aligned with the research methods that have been used, are they appropriate? And we have looked at the interpretation of these results. In this series that we are starting now, we are want to take this to the next level. We are starting to look at how do we take the evidence that is published, the evidence in the scientific literature, and how do we take that out or extract it and apply it to our clinical setting. How do we move it from the paper, if you can call, say it that way, from the realm of the paper to actual application on a clinical patient? The objectives of this journal club series include clinical integration of evidence. And I use the term integration as opposed to translation or application because we want to integrate the research evidence with clinical practice and by saying integration we are committing that clinical practice has got several factors that can impact outcomes and evidence is just one part of that puzzle we need to integrate evidence rather than just take evidence that is published as research outcomes and apply it integration then involves a pragmatic translation of research evidence it has to be pragmatic. It just can't be an assess, taken as is and applied. It has to be grounded in local realities and contexts. And there are no prescriptive hand downs. There is no way to say that, well, this is what is found. And so this is the only way that it has to be done. And so we need to look at understanding how the different nuances of the evidence that is there, the different nuances of the reporting that's there, the different nuances of the terms that's there, and then figure out how we integrate that with clinical practice. What we aim to do is to bring about an exploration of a way of thinking. It's not the only way. It's one way. So we want to explore one way of thinking that can be practiced in all settings and use that way of thinking as a foundation to then branch out into different ways of thinking that can be relevant to your own practice. Radiology is an imaging science. Imaging is very fundamental to the science of radiology. And when we say science, we are then committing that there are certain frameworks within which radiology operates. And these frameworks include systematic, a systematic approach, it involves consistency, it involves reliability, it involves reproducibility, precision, accuracy, and the ability to constantly evaluate what's happening. When we say science, we have to understand that science is constantly evolving. Science is never static. And because science is constantly evolving and not static, the truth that science claims to have found it's never going to be static. It's going to be dynamic and evolving. And hence, the whole process is always a process of constant evaluation, reaffirmation of what's known and finding out what's new. If you want to provide better care to patients, if you want to have more meaningful interactions, better interactions with the referring physicians, we need to understand the science within which we operate. It's only when we understand the science within which we operate that we are able to then look for newer things as well as reaffirm what's already known. This then brings us to the language that's commonly used when we, in science or when we, the language of science, as we may call it. Science has a pretty uniform language that's applicable across most settings. 
especially because it wants to enable people who are entering into that world to be able to understand what's being communicated by the other person and to communicate in a very precise, accurate manner to the other person that enables replication, reproducibility of research results or clinical findings within that world. The terms are useful to determine which imaging modality is more appropriate to use in which clinical situation. The terms are also useful in the reporting of findings, especially in an interpretative report. I emphasize on interpretative report as opposed to a report where we just list down a traffic jam of findings and then tell the referring physician that, well, we did this particular test and we found all this and hey, here it is. Good luck to you and to your patient. Go ahead and interpret it your way. An interpretative report is one where we say that well, we use this and this is the way we went about it and this is what we found and given the in the context of the clinical information that you have given and in the context of what we have used as the imaging modality and the findings that we have got, this is what we think it is. Now please take this and integrate it with the findings that you have clinically and then reach an idea about where you want to take it further, where you want to take the clinical care further. So we'll bring these terms to a more meaningful clinical interpretation. While doing that, we have to understand the pitfalls and confusion that can occur in clinical interpretation and in the use of these terms. The terms are specific. The terms have a very specific context, very specific meaning. The terms have been misinterpreted. The terms have been used in literal sense. The terms have been overused. And hence, it's very, very important for us to take a step back and look at what do these terms actually mean. And then look at the way we have been using them and then to look at if that's been appropriate or not. We'll use a case-based approach for this. We are using a case-based approach in this instance to set a foundation for understanding the terms. And as we go further down the line, we will be working upon more complex cases and then working upon getting into more depth in the interpretation of these findings. We are also going to be looking at a conceptual interpretative approach to the terms rather than a statistical approach to the terms about this is how we calculate it and this is what you need to do to calculate it. We're not getting into the statistics part of it, the calculation part of it. We'll run a separate series for biostats at a later stage, besides which these have been covered extensively in your undergraduate program and you can always get back out there and then search the net and find many articles that give you good summaries or summations of these particular terms. So case one, you are covering the radiology service at a busy rural district level hospital with limited inpatient capacity. A 50-year-old male is referred with symptoms of mild fever, irregular cough and mild generalized body aches since the past five days. The patient is in a COVID hotspot, no history of travel or contact. The referring physician sends the patient to you for chest and lung assessment. Now you have access to a chest radiograph, USG and CT at your hospital. Let's say you choose to do a chest radiograph as the initial test. The CT machine is new, it's in the unboxed stage, it's state-of-the-art toy that's meant to be looked at with admiration. But you're still not fully into the, let's say, everyone can use it stage and for everyone. You know how it is. So you look for several radiographic features, including consolidation, ground glass opacities, pulmonary nodules, and use an acceptable diagnostic glossary like the Fleischner Society of Glossary of Terms. Now, if you want to pronounce Fleischner if, differently, if this is not the correct pronunciation, please feel free to go ahead and pronounce it the way it has to be pronounced. In the meantime, you also want to quantify the extent of infection and hence you use a severity score calculated by adapting and simplifying the radiographic assessment of lung edema score that's been proposed by Warren et al. The RALE score. You find a severity score of 1 to 2 with mild findings in the chest radiograph. You're happy, you're on top of your game, you're on top of the world. 
you found something using the chest x-ray you didn't have to use the CT and it's not, not something that's very extreme at the other end of the spectrum so you you're socially distancing and now you pick up your telephone and then call up the referring physician and tell well I did a chest radiograph and you know what we found a severity score 1 to 2 with mild findings in the chest radiograph yeah this is what it is how do you want to proceed and the referring physician says well why did you do a chest radiograph shouldn't we be doing a CT scan for this patient what exactly is the sensitivity of chest radiograph to diagnose possible COVID lung changes? Just in a CT have better sensitivity. Shouldn't we be then u using a CT? You have a CT there, don't you? Why didn't you use that? Why did you use the chest radiograph? Well, you're now on the hot seat. You have to justify your approach now. Well, it's, you try, you start by trying very hard not to use all the florid language that is now coming up in your mind or running through your mind. And you have to justify your approach as to why this particular modality was chosen and why it's effective and why the results are still valid. We are now entering into the world of describing test effectiveness. And that's how we justify why a test is better or test is used. There are a few main aspects to consider when we talk of a test effectiveness. Primarily we are looking at is one test superior to the other. When we say superior to the other, it also includes a subsets of equivalent, equivalence or inferiority. Clinically, what is it that you want to convey to the referring physician? When you talk about effectiveness, what is it that you want to convey to the referring physician? And more important, what is it that the clinician really wants to know? There are certain terms that are commonly used when we describe test effectiveness. These include sensitivity, specificity, predictive values, diagnostic odds ratio, odd ratios, likelihood ratios, post-test probabilities. Usually, much of the discussion, much of the literature centers around sensitivity and specificity. It's almost like the other terms are left to fend for themselves in a dark world till the sunlight comes and liberates them. But usually we talk about sensitivity and specificity alone. So let's start by looking at these terms and see whether they're appropriate when we, to use when we talk about test effectiveness and a clinical setting. Sensitivity and specificity describe how a test performs in people with known disease status. And that's an important consideration. They describe how a test performs in people with known disease status. Now that's not what you see in clinical practice. In clinical practice, you deal with patients of unknown disease status. So you need to hit the pause button right there. If sensitivity and specificity describe how a test performs in people with known disease status, can you use those terms to describe how a test might perform or to describe the appropriateness of a test when we take it to people with unknown disease status. The denominator has changed. It's not the same denominator anymore. So does that apply? Let's look at sensitivity in a little bit, little bit more detail, very brief. Sensitivity expresses how a test performs in people known to have the disease. In all the people with the disease, the sensitivity of test tells you how many people test positive. In all the people with the disease. Test performances can differ. They can differ based on the biology of the disease, the chemical or anatomical or structural abnormalities or even the stages of the disease. They can also differ based on the characteristics of the test. How well the machinery or chemical test detect the abnormalities. For example, the sensitivity of ultrasound for gallstones depends on the underlying biology of gallstones, the size and composition, the technology of the ultrasound machine, the technique of the sonographer, the skill of the reader, the person interpreting the images. All of this matters. All of this has a role to play in the sensitivity of the test. That's finally reported. So every step along the way affects the overall sensitivity of the test. 
So when you are talking about the sensitivity sensitivity of a test as being 90%, you have to also factor in all these pre-existing conditions. You have to factor in the stages of the disease, the biology of the disease, the characteristics of the tests, including the technology that has been used, the machine that has been used, a high-end machine, a lower-end machine, the technique of the sonographer, the experience, skill, and the technique and skill and experience of the person who is interpreting the images. Specificity is how the test performs in people who are known to not have the disease or in other ways apparently normal people without the disease. Specificity also differs based on the biology of the disease, the characteristics of the test. Let's look at an same example. Specificity of ultrasound for gallstones, for example, involves the biology of healthy people. How often do patients without gallstones have high density sludge, polyps or other mimics, other stone mimics? You need to know that. And the characteristics of the ultrasound machine and the sonologist, when nothing is there, we need to remember that medicine more or less trains us to find abnormalities and radiology is no exception. We are trained to find abnormalities. We are trained to look for abnormalities. We are trained so much that often we don't know what to do when nothing is abnormal. Our training is entirely focused on looking at trying to find out abnormality that the normal is sort of why are you here? So we need to think, does the sonologist capture images with artifacts over the lumen mimicking stones? Do they tend to overcall gold stones? Do they tend to overdiagnose? That happens. It's a reality. The most important question that we had in the beginning remains. Can we use the sensitivity and specificity of a test if they can only be calculated in people with known disease status, which is not our population? Our population is people with unknown disease status. So then can we take these parameters? Can we apply it in our clinical setting? Does it make sense to do that? We also need to then look at the reference standard against which the sensitivity is or specificity is estimated. What happens if the reference standards are imperfect? Now let, let's look at reference standards. Reference standards can be another test. The test can be a perfect test, can be an imperfect test. The reference standard can be clinical conditions, signs and symptoms. And if the signs and symptoms are not correlated with histopathology, not correlated with microbiology, or not correlated with other objective measures, then we are going to have an inaccurate estimation of sensitivity and specificity. So we need to be seeing what reference standard was used and is that reference standard appropriate and given that it might be imperfect, how do we use this? So there are problems. There are problems quite a bit with sensitivity and specificity. It's not just an easy take application. 90% sensitivity, high sensitivity, very good, let's take it, apply, no. It's not just a straight away interpretative application of well spin, snout, a highly specific test is negative, is positive, rule in the disease. A highly sensitive test is negative, rule out the disease. That's one way of clinically applying it, but we need to keep in mind what's happening behind when we talk about sensitivity and specificity before we can use spin or snout to translate it into or apply it into a clinical situation. We need to think what is the clinician really interested in, you as a clinician, the diagnosing clinician, as well as the clinician who has referred the patient to you. Not so much interested in the false positive rate or the false negative rate. If I have referred the patient to you, I'm not interested in you telling me that, well, the false positive, at a false positive rate, we see that so much in the literature now, at a false positive rate of 10%, the, the sensitivity of this test is so much. At a false positive rate of 15%, it's so much. At a false positive rate of 5%, it's so much. We see quite a bit of that happening in the communications. But as a clinician, especially if I am in a BCOPD setting, if I am in a non-tertiary care setting, 
that doesn't make any sense to me. That's not what I want to know. What I want to really know is if this test result is positive, does that mean this patient has the disease? If it is negative, does that mean that this patient does not have the disease? I need it in simple terms. I need it boxed down, cut down, compartmentalized so that I can take it, look at it, interpret it very fast and look at the further clinical course for that patient. I don't need statistical jargons there. I don't need too many things, co complex things sitting there and then too many mathematical permutations to be worked through. So neither sensitivity nor specificity lead us there. They don't get us to tell that they'll this patient has the disease, so this patient does not have the disease. Predictive values are better. So let's look at predictive values. Predictive values are also used commonly. They are not so commonly used in the radiology literature. They are slowly starting to percolate through. But they are commonly used in the epidemiology literature. In the literal sense, a predictive value is something that can predict. The positive predictive value is the proportion of patients with a true positive test among all patients who have a positive test. So now we have seen that the denominator is changing from a disease-centric approach, known disease, unknown, no disease, to positive test and negative test. The negative proportion uh, predictive value is the proportion of patients with a true negative test among all patients with a negative test. The predictive values can be directly applied to a clinical population. With clinical patients, we want to know what proportion of people have the disease if they have a positive test, what proportion of people do not have the disease if they have a negative diagnostic test result. And that's exactly what the predictive values tell us. So if you have a positive test, it tells 70% predictive value if 100 people have had the disease. Sorry, if 100 people have a positive, have a had the test, 70% of them who test positive will have the disease. There are pitfalls with the predictive values as well. They depend upon the prevalence of the condition. They depend upon the specificity of the test. The prevalence of the condition, if it's applied and as the prevalence increases, the predictive values tend to improve in their performance, especially the positive predictive value. The negative predictive value is more intrinsically linked with the specificity of the test. So a, a test can have different predictive values based on the settings in which they are applied. If you are taking a test that has been developed in a specialty unit, let's say a test, a diagnostic imaging modality test that's been looked at for lung cancers as an example, hypothetical example, and has been developed in and tested, validated in a super specialty oncology unit. And you find a set of predictive values. You take the same set of predictive values and the same, same test, and if you apply it in a primary care center where the prevalence of lung cancers is much, much, much lower, you're going to have a very different set of outcomes. The predictive values are going to be very, very, very different. At that point in the primary care setting, the whole situation would be, well, I invested in this particular test. I invested in it based on what you reported as the values. I invested in it and it's not working the same way. It's not as effective. You gave a positive predictive value of 90%, but I am finding it less than 10%. But then that's because the prevalence, underlying prevalence of the condition has changed. It's not the same. So taking a test result as it is from a particular population, subset of a population, and then applying it to a different population does not give you the same result. Don't expect that to happen. What should we remember? Sensitivity, specificity, predict predictive values, positive or negative, are strictly valid only for the population from which they are obtained. You need to really look at the study uh, population characteristics and then figure out if that's similar or at least nearly similar to the population that you see. To interpret the utility of a test for your clinical practice, you have to pay close attention to the characteristics of the study problem. There's no go around that. Just look at the numbers in the table at the result section or in the abstract and then say that 90% sensitivity, 80% specificity, 
in a population that was studied in Boston, take it and bring it to a population in Tutukuri or in a rural place and a rural place in India. No, it doesn't work that way. You're not going to get the same results. You might. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. You might by chance, but it's not. Work. that's not the way it usually works. We need to see how results reported in the literature fit into our clinical practice. It's very critical to understand the relationship between each study population and that encountered in our own clinical environment. That's important. It's important for us to do that before we take the test result and apply it. We also have to understand that there are going to be marked differences. It's most likely, more likely than not, to exist between your practice versus research study populations. Research study populations are well-controlled environments. They've got strict inclusion criteria, strict exclusion criteria, strict exit criteria, study end criteria. Your clinical population is not in a well-controlled environment. It's not doesn't have strict criteria there. It's a mix. So you, application has to be pragmatic. Application has to be based on the foundations that the test has been built upon and then adapting those foundations into your clinical practice. Important cons considerations include characteristics such as age, demographic factors, comorbid diseases, stage at the time of imaging, spectrum of disease severity, the proportion of critically ill patients and those with no symptoms at the time of diagnosis. Now, this is important in looking at COVID. Most of our studies have looked at critically ill patients. What about asymptomatic patients? We have not done enough testing, so we don't know. So how, then, how do we then look at the sensitivity and specificity and the predictive values or the test effectiveness when the spectrum is different? So taking, keeping the underlying, understanding the underlying study population characteristics is important. Research studies usually assume equal access to medical care because it's a well-controlled environment. But in the real world, there is no equal access to medical care. There are issues of logistics, there are issues of equity, political issues, socioeconomic issues, education, gender, the whole set of issues that impact upon access to care. Taking a test result from a well-controlled environment like research applying it into a clinical population, a clinical care setting, you need to, you need to, you need to really look at how the test performs. Don't expect it to be the same. It may be the same, but don't expect it to always be the same. We need to remember that in reality, there is probably no single true sensitivity, specificity or predictive value that would apply to all clinical practice settings. That's a myth, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because the population settings is different. It's not going to happen because the prevalence of the condition is different. It's not going to happen because there are so many characteristics that make people differ from each other within populations itself. So there's so many factors that make people differ from each other, populations differ from each other. Now having looked at the basics or some of the, at the, at trying to get some sense of the terms that are commonly used. I hope you are with me so far. And if you're not with me so far, I would recommend that you go back and try to read more on these terms. And this is not something that can be digested or taken in within a short period. This is something that has to be reflected on and worked upon slowly. So we do hope that you go back and you look at these terms, see what they mean and look at what their interpretations are. And as we go into further, into further discussions along this journal club series, we'll be looking at these terms again and again, trying to distill down and trying to reinforce the conceptual understanding of these terms. But in the meantime, let's look at what we have. We have few studies that have looked at chest radiograph, three studies. We have 19 studies that have looked at CT scan. We have one lung ultrasound study, and these are studies on chest imaging in COVID patients. We have sensitivity and specificity reported, and we see that CT scan has got a good sensitivity, as has lung ultrasound. But then we also see that lung ultrasound has got only one study. Chest radiograph studies are very less. 
CT scan does not have a good specificity. Chest radiograph and lung ultrasound have a good specificity. To recap, we have few studies, different study population characteristics. The more imp most important thing when we look at the papers here, if we don't look at the papers and look only at the sensitivity and specificity, what we miss is that the studies did not compare one modality versus the other. So the CT scan studies were not comparing CT scans with chest radiographs. They were a comparison of CT scans with no image. The chest radiograph studies were a comparison of chest radiograph versus no image. So we are not able, we, we don't have an idea of how one test compares with the other test. Is one superior to the other, equivalent or non-equivalent? We only have an idea of one test compares with no image. We also see that predictive values have not been reported, but this can be estimated. So if they are not been reported, we have the sensitivity and specificity, we have the prevalence of the condition, then we can estimate the predictive values. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's look at the predictive values and accuracy for a population prevalence of 20% and 40% and see what happens. At a 20% prevalence, we find that the negative predictive values are good, very good for lung ultrasound, CT, a little bit less for chest radiograph. However, we find that the accuracy is good for chest radiograph and lung ultrasound. The accuracy is on the lower side, 63.20 for a CT, and that's because the positive predictive value is much on the lower side. When we're looking at a 40% prevalence, we are seeing that the positive predictive values have moved up. We are seeing changes in the negative predictive value. We are also seeing the accuracy has changed. It's the accuracy of CT, for example, has moved from 63.20 to 70.40. None of these three test modalities, even at a 40% prevalence, have got a very good accuracy. Lung ultrasound is 87.80, but we do need to consider that that was just one study. And when we have only one study, we need to look at it, keep it in mind, but it's difficult to generalize that for any practical purpose. So what we have seen is that predictive values and diagnostic accuracy change as the prevalence increased. Moving forward, what's the recommendations that are available? If the purpose of the test is to diagnose COVID-19, chest imaging is not a primary modality, RT-PCR is a better modality, it's got a better diagnostic effectiveness, so we wouldn't recommend a chest imaging in that situation. Chest imaging is recommended if RT-PCR is not available, if there's a delayed result or a delayed testing, or if, and if we want to have a benchmark against which we can document progression of the disease. And that has to be kept in mind progression of the disease, serial monitoring. We have to consider the following. CT scan has the highest sensitivity. Well, CT scan compared to chest radiograph and is preferred in patients with pre-existing pulmonary disease. At this point, we need to also keep in mind that well, CT scan has a higher sensitivity reported. We also need to consider that CT scan was used in most studies and because that has been used in most studies that those are the results that are out there and because those are the results that are out there those form the basis for guidelines. We don't have enough studies on chest radiographs, we don't have enough studies on lung ultrasound so they don't really come into the picture of the making of the guideline. So the primary choice in the initial phase also has an effect on how the guidelines are developed. What we know is that chest X-ray has a lower sensitivity, less number of studies, three, but still has a lower sensitivity, but it is associated with a lower risk of infection transmission. It is less resource intensive, it's associated with lower radiation doses and CT scan, and it's easier to repeat sequentially for monitoring disease progression. So that's what we know with the chest radiograph. We need to consider these factors as well and not just the predictive value and accuracy alone when we are now trying to see which modality should we choose. Lung ultrasound has got limited evidence, but it's helpful with the appropriate expertise and can be done as a focus, a point of care test. 
However, it requires closer interaction with the patient's physical proximity of the operator to the patient for a longer period of time and specific infection prevention and control systems, precautions. So it's not so exciting at this particular stage. We also need to consider the differential diagnosis that we are keeping in mind when we are doing the imaging modality. And we are going to balance the ability of the primary modality that we are choosing to also address the differential diagnosis. So at the point that we are doing the test, we are also looking at the differential diagnosis, not just the primary diagnosis. <coughs> Ideally, the choice should be through a shared decision making involving the patient. <coughs> it doesn't happen in our settings. So let's say that's good to know, but it doesn't happen usually. So the referring physician and the radiologist. Now the referring physician and the radiologist communication is important from the perspective of the diagnosis, from the perspective of the differential diagnosis, from the perspective of the clinical information, from the perspective of how the referring physician plans to use the information that you provide. And that gives you an idea of how you want to approach the imaging modality that's to be chosen. Your conversation with the referring physician is useful to justify the choice of modality to explain the strengths of the modality that you have chosen and to also give its limitations so that the referring physician is able to interpret it more meaningfully. With specific reference to COVID, there are several problems and opportunities. There are few studies, it's a rapidly evolving pandemic, comparative studies are not there. Diverse study population with diverse characteristics, predictive values and diagnostic accuracy are not reported but can be estimated. Who has the time to estimate that? Who has the patience to estimate that? Who wants to estimate that? Are questions that need to be answered. Don't expect perfect studies and guidelines in pandemics. Guidelines are usually developed over three to four years with rigorous controls. A pandemic does not give you the luxury of passing through that process. So don't expect perfect studies. When you don't expect perfect studies, it means you need to be on the top of your game in the ability to interpret the evidence that's placed out there. Interpreting perfect evidence does not need as much skill as interpreting imperfect evidence. To interpret imperfect evidence, you need to be on top of your game. Pandemics evolve rapidly, will be in a dynamic state, the evidence will change, not on top of your game, you're going to lose the ability to choose and use an imaging modality appropriately. It also shows us the need and shows us the opportunity to develop local standards for local populations. What we have shown very briefly is that taking and applying the terms by its very specific nature and definition do not really encourage the taking and application of the results from a different population to another population without subsequent evaluation of what is happening. So how do we choose the mo modality? We need evidence integrated decision making as opposed to evidence based decision making. If we are going by evidence based decision making in this instance, we can say that well, CT has got a higher sensitivity. Its diagnostic accuracy is not too bad, not too good, not too bad. There are more studies on CT, that's the evidence. So I will take that and apply it. Evidence integrated decision making will make me say, well, just radiograph is not too bad off when I compare the accuracy of just radiograph with CT. Yeah, there are problems with the study population, the number of studies. There is no comparison of just radiograph with the CT scan, but I am trying to balance that with the other factors that include the risk of infection transmission, the resources, the ability and experience that I have in interpreting it or my staff has in doing it, performing the test and interpreting it and the ability to use chest x-ray to serially monitor a patient as compared to a CT. So we need to know 
what we are doing here is we are taking evidence and we are saying, well, you are just one part of the clinical puzzle. You are not the entirety of the clinical puzzle. You are one part of the clinical puzzle. I need to see you. I need to understand you. I need to adapt you into the clinical puzzle. However, you cannot adapt evidence to the larger puzzle unless you understand the science of evidence. And that is what we are trying to show you. We are not trying to go into a complete depth and in-depth explanation and make everything clear at this stage itself. We are only, this is only a primer that is putting the terms out there, putting the confusion around the terms out there and telling you, well, take a step back and reflect on this and see what's happening with the test and your clinical population. So how do you choose the modality? Evidence integrated with available resources, predictive values based on local context, costs including time, personal scheduling, dialogue with the referring physician, and interpretative ability with results focused on clinically relevant information. That's how you choose the modality. The choice of a modality, when we say evidence-based decision-making, we are often tending to limit the evidence-based decision-making, as we call it, entirely on to test effectiveness terms. And we are not using test effectiveness terms in its entirety, the way it has to be used. We are again moving on to more the use of sensitivity and specificity. And then saying that, let's take that and apply to a clinical population. That doesn't work, we have seen the very nature of those terms are not meant for that. They are meant to direct you into predictive values. They are meant to direct you again further down the line into diagnostic odds ratios, into likelihood ratios. But that's not the way we are using it now. In this particular case, the guidelines say CT. The question we want to leave you with is, is there a compelling case that can be made for chest radiographs? Can we say that the choice of chest radiograph is incorrect? Can we say that, well, only CT should be done? Then what do we do with the vast majority of patients who don't have access to a place that has CT? Consider scheduling difficulties, considering the number of tests that you can do, considering the number of machines that are available, consider the number of people who are there who can read a CT properly. So these are questions that we want to leave you with. And Essentially, this journal club is directing you to try and think and then try to understand and figure out the answer for this question. So we are not telling you, you should be using a CT. We are not telling you, you should be using a chest radiograph. And this is why it has to be done. We are telling you, well, we have given you bits of information. What do you think should be done? And very, very importantly, we want you to consider your local population, your local clinical population and the prevalence in your local clinical population when you make that decision. That's a key learning from this journal club. To emphasize again, our journal club series aims to make you think and go deeper into the subject. We do not intend to give you ready-made clinical answers. That's not the purpose of a journal club. We do not intend to tell you that this is what is there in the research, has been published as a research paper, and this is what is told, and this is the sensitivity, this is the effectiveness. Go ahead and do it. That's it. Nope. What we want you to do is expand the limits of your mind, keeping in mind your expertise, your comfort levels, your skill levels, the machinery that you have, and the local and the clinical population that you see. It has to be applicable to your population. If it's not, it's not serving its purpose. Thank you so much for listening, assuming that all of you are still there with me and not slept and still alive and breathing. I'll recommend that you go back, take some time off, look at these terms, do a search, figure out what these terms mean, and then try to see how it fits into your clinical practice. And hopefully, you will be willing to come back for more as we get into each of these terms in more depth at a later stage. Thank you once again.